Flat Earth Experiments Determining the shape of the Earth using tools, observations, and measurements you make yourself, all in your own backyard. Part 2 Size of the Sun This video will detail the first of four sun observations. In this series, it is extremely important that you do not look at the sun directly. If you'd like further guidance, just Google observing the sun and take the advice seriously. The sun is a tremendous source of all kinds of electromagnetic radiation beyond the visible range, so don't try your own creative solutions like stacking sunglasses or the like, because you can seriously hurt your eyes. And if you point a camera at the midday sun and zoom in, you can fry your camera sensor. Here's a quick overview. We're going to record the visible size of the sun at several times during the day, either after sunrise or before sunset, and at noon. The flat earth model says that the sun moves towards the viewer at sunrise, then moves away at sunset. Thus, the size should change. The globe earth model has the sun essentially at the same 93 million mile distance, with sunrise and sunset due to the earth's rotation. Thus, the size shouldn't change. Supplies. You'll need a camera and some cardboard boxes. The bigger, the better. If you have some scrap cardboard from buying furniture or a flat screen TV, that can work well. You'll also need duct tape, aluminum foil, a push pin or thumbtack, a ruler, and some graph paper. If you don't have graph paper, you can print your own off the internet. If you plan on observing the sun directly by zooming in with your digital SLR, you'll need some number 14 welder's glass, a lens hood for your camera, rubber bands, and electrical tape. A tripod to hold your camera steady may help. I got my welder's glass by purchasing a solar eclipse viewer from Amazon for about 20 bucks. It's just a heavy cardboard frame around a piece of glass. I ripped off the cardboard so I could use the glass directly. Here's the plan of attack. We'll first build the tools we needed to make our observations. Then we'll actually record the measurements using whatever units work for you, such as inches, millimeters, or pixels. The next step is optional, standardizing the data. This will convert your units to a standard measurement, diameter in degrees. This will be helpful if you want to compare your results with others. Lastly, we'll take a look at the two models for the shape of the Earth and describe how our measurements might relate to the flat Earth model or the globe model. Step 1. Making the tools. There are two methods we'll use, a pinhole sun viewer and photographing the sun directly with a filter made of welder's glass. The first method will be very helpful with video number 3 of this series, measuring the speed of the sun while the digital SLR method will be very helpful when we observe the moon, without the filter, of course. Pinhole Sun Viewer. The concept here is that we'll build a pinhole camera without the film, and with a long focal length, the longer the better, so we can project a nice image of the sun onto graph paper. We'll photograph the image and then use the graph paper to measure the size of the sun. There are many resources online to help you with this project, especially at deepskywatch.com or you can Google Pinhole Solar Viewer. Under most conditions, light travels only in a straight path. Thus, a pinhole camera works by permitting light rays to enter only through a tiny hole. This will project an upside down image with left and right reversed. This is the basis for the very first cameras, which didn't use a lens, but rather a tiny hole in a perfectly dark room. To build my pinhole sun viewer, I started with an oblong box since I wanted the image to be as large as possible. I took a box which Amazon used to ship me a poster tube, but you can use a standard size box, or you could take a large sheet of cardboard and fold it into a rectangular tube. The box shown here is about three feet long and six inches wide and deep. The size and shape doesn't matter, but longer might give you better results. Cut a hole in one end and cover it with foil, then punch a tiny hole in the foil with a pin or a thumbtack. Then, cut a hole in the other end, through which you'll view the sun's image. This shows the inside of the box, the end opposite to the pinhole. I've lined it with some graph paper, on which I wrote the standards for my viewer. Yours will have different specifications. I also drew uh, crosshairs in the graph paper, which will be important in video number three on the speed of the sun. If you have time and resources, you can try different variations. I used a fairly thick push pin from a bulletin board, and maybe I could have used a needle to make the pinhole. This will sharpen the image of the sun, but also make it dimmer. 
You could also try different length boxes to make the sun larger. A larger sun will be easier to measure with better precision, but the larger the image, the dimmer the image, so there are trade-offs. Next we'll describe the digital SLR method with number 14 welder's glass. The filter is important. There are many images and videos of sunsets where the sun really overwhelms the image sensor, and it's difficult to see the actual sun's precise size. Can you tell how big the sun is in this image? How did you do? One benefit of using a filter is that it will provide a control. With a sun filter, such as a number 14 welder's glass, we'll get a precise measurement of the sun every time. There are a number of ways to attach the glass to your SLR, but a very unobtrusive method will be to use a backwards lens hood. Many hoods are designed to be mounted backwards when not in use, which provide ears around which you can attach your glass with rubber bands. I also used electrical tape to seal the hairline crack between the hood and the glass. Lastly, you'll want to make sure that your camera has the correct date and time. This will timestamp every photo you take, making later analysis easier. My camera is about three years old, so it maxed out at an 80x zoom. If your camera goes further, make sure you can easily pick a certain zoom that will capture the full sun since we'll be measuring the diameter. If your zoom goes even further than mine, it will be helpful later on if you want to capture sunspots in video number five on the shape of the sun. It will also be very important that every photo you take in this video will be the sun at the exact same zoom level. So practice and be very mindful when taking your pictures. It will be very difficult to make comparisons without a standard zoom level for every one of your photos. Step two, taking measurements. You'll want to dedicate a notebook for your series of experiments. And you don't have to spend a lot of money on an official field guide notebook. Your simple composition uh, book is a favorite. It only costs a few dollars and the pages are sewn together, unlike a spiral notebook or a glue bound notebook. But use whatever works for you. You'll want to record the official sunrise sunset times for your location using either your local newspaper or a website. This will help frame the times of your sun observations. Every time you take your sun measurements, repeat the procedure three times. This may seem silly, but if you do your measurements in triplicate and then average the three readings, you'll make your data more precise and reliable. Every time you record a measurement, record the exact date and time in your field notes logbook. At a minimum, you'll want to record the measurements twice, in the morning after sunrise or in the evening before sunset, and at noon. Even better will be to bookend the noon observation with both morning and evening observations. If you're ambitious and really want to act like a scientist, record observations once an hour for the entire day. Just be mindful that extremely close to sunrise or sunset, there may be atmospheric distortion. As the sun's rays go through more layers of air, just be mindful of this possibility. To use the pinhole viewer, you can sit it in your lap or prop it up against something. I find it helpful to align it by looking at the shadow of the viewer itself. When the shadows on the viewer indicate that the edges of the cardboard box are parallel to the sun's rays, look inside for the image of the sun. When using a pinhole viewer, I found it very helpful to use my smartphone camera to simply take a snapshot of the image on the graph paper. This way I could record my estimate of the sun's diameter later taking my time. Here is a zoomed in view. Notice that my viewer was not perfectly light proof and had several other little holes in the corners of the box. But don't forget to record the standards of your viewer. My viewer was 34.5 inches long and my graph paper had five squares per inch. Your specs will vary. Do the math and determine the diameter of the sun, for example, in inches or millimeters, as you prefer. Here is a sample logbook layout for recording pinhole viewer measurements. Pause the video if you want the details. If taking measurements with your digital SLR, it is important that you record the zoom level for every photo. This will help you stay focused on this standard that you've set for yourself. Also, record the time and date in your logbook to make it easier to line up with the camera's metadata when you download your images. 
Later on, you can record the sun's diameter in either pixels or screen inches. Here's a sample logbook for digital SLR images. Pause the video here if you want the details. Step 3. Standardizing the data. Optional, only if you want to compare data with others. If you used a pinhole viewer, your measurements are probably in inches or millimeters, so you'll learn how to convert them to the sun's diameter in degrees. If you use a digital SLR, then you'll convert from either pixels or screen inches to diameter in degrees. It's important that you know the focal length of your pinhole viewer. Try to record as accurately as possible the distance from the pinhole to the graph paper. Be careful since the foil might have pushed inward when you punched the hole, thus making the focal length slightly smaller. To do this calculation, you'll need the focal length f and the diameter of the sun d to be in the same units. This means if you measured the focal length in centimeters, but the diameter in millimeters, you'll have to convert. This formula uses inverse tangent, also known as arctangent, and the results and results in the angle theta. Be sure your calculator is set for degrees and not radians. Here's a sample using my measurements. In my photo earlier in this video, I found the sun to be one-third of an inch, which translates to 0 0.55 degrees in diameter. Standardizing our data from a digital SLR will be more difficult since all cameras have different levels of zoom, different pixel recording abilities, and different image sensor sizes. Our solution will be to record a reference image, such as a sheet of standard office paper using the same level zoom as your sun images with known parameters. We'll then be able to compute the sun's size in degrees by using a proportion. My calculations will be based on an 11 inch tall sheet of paper exactly 50 yards away. Simply use a sheet of office paper taped to a stick stuck on the goal line of a football field. An 11 inch tall piece of paper at 50 yards is exactly 0.35 degrees, which we'll use in our proportion to compare it with the sun image. We just want to compare the image of the sun to the image of the paper, so it doesn't matter what units we use as long as we are consistent. Make sure you open each image with 100% magnification so you're comparing apples to apples. If you can measure the images in pixels, such as using your own software, that will work well. Otherwise, you could simply hold a ruler up to your computer screen to measure the two images to find S and P. Since the sheet of paper measures 0.35 degrees, we'll use S and P in this equation based on a proportion to give us the sun diameter in degrees. Step 4. Flat Earth versus Globe Earth Analysis Again, in this series of 15 videos, we're only considering two models, the Flat Earth model and the Globe Earth model. We'll start by looking at the behavior of the sun in both models so we can make sense of our data. Before we look at the flat earth model, we need to note that the Gleason's flat earth map might not be perfect, but there are several things that are not in dispute. The relative positions are correct. For example, the North Atlantic is west of Europe and North America is west of the North Atlantic. The distances to the North Pole from anywhere on the Gleason map are precise. Both the flat earth map and the standard globe are in exact, measure, or exact agreement with regards to distance from anywhere to the North Pole. If you don't want to be distracted by potential problems with the Gleason map, there is an alternative that keeps things vague but relative, the Abizade map of 1920. The Abizade map simply labels large geographic areas with their relative general position, such as Greenland, northeast of North America, and the tropics and equator in orange with South America south of North America. What is important in our analysis is noting that on the flat Earth map throughout the day, the sun moves towards and away from any viewer not close to the North Pole. The exact distances aren't important. The proportional distances are. In the flat Earth model, the sun follows a circle above the equator for spring and fall, or slightly smaller or larger circles above the tropics for summer and winter, all at a 3,000 mile elevation. As the sun circles clockwise, it illuminates half the Earth, giving us day and night. This diagram shows high noon in West Africa, but sunrise in central United States and sunset in Asia. Let's zoom in and just focus on the land north of the equator, with our target location being Missouri in the United States. Again, we're being very general here, just to get a sense of the proportional distances. 
This diagram shows the locations of the sun at sunrise, noon, and sunset, assuming 12 hours of daylight, such as on the equinox. We'll try to compute the distance of the sun to an observer in Missouri at sunrise, noon, and sunset. This is a 2D view, so it's hard to see the actual distances, since the sun is 3,000 miles in elevation. Switching to a 3D view and using colored right triangles, we could see the hypotenuse of each right triangle shows the distance of the sun to Missouri. We'll plug in the map distance and the 3,000 mile sun elevation into the Pythagorean theorem and find each hypotenuse. If we do the math, we find that at noon, the sun is exactly twice as close to southern Missouri than at sunrise or sunset. If you repeat the procedure with an observer elsewhere on the flat earth map, you'll find the difference to be more often dramatic. This table goes from the North Pole at the top to the Antarctic ice wall at the bottom, with the equator in the middle. Here's a world map, easier to read than the Gleason's map, with how much bigger the sun will appear at noon. You could read between the lines to approximate for your location. For example, in London, it will be about 1.6 times as big, while in Cape Town, it will be about 2.9 times as big. Now let's discuss the globe Earth model. The globe Earth model has the sun 93 million miles away, and the Earth's rotation gives us night and day. As viewed from above the North Pole, the Earth rotates counterclockwise, giving sunrise to folks on the right side of this image and sunset on the left. Since the sun is so far away in the globe Earth model, the sun is essentially the same distance away from sunrise through noon to sunset. To review the two models, in the flat Earth model, Sunrise and sunset are caused by the sun moving towards or away from the viewer. In the globe Earth model, sunrise and sunset are caused by the rotation of the Earth in comparison to a very distant sun. So how does your data about the sun relate? If it appears to be much bigger at noon than at either sunrise or sunset, this supports the flat Earth model. If it stays more or less the same, this supports the globe Earth model. Please note that this doesn't prove anything. The data you gathered simply might support one model over another. To be more certain, more data gathering is needed from a variety of sources, as we'll discuss in the rest of the series. Our next video is number three, Speed of the Sun. It will require our pinhole solar viewer, but with modifications to keep it rock steady. When commenting on this or any other viewer, Please keep an open mind and remember to be kind to each other. Practice what Stephen Covey recommends. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Thank you.